Hi, this is Kelly, and I want to welcome you back, and if you haven't watched one of my videos, then I want to welcome you, and I'm glad you decided to stop by. <laughs> Today is also going to be a true crime story. And, um, it is about well, Massachusetts true crime stories. So, Secrets, Serial Killers, and Mile Heist. True Crime Stories of New England. So, um, how are y'all doing? Oops, let's see here. Um, while we Continue working on our whip, which is with a uh, work in progress. So, if you don't know, let's see here. And I am continuing to work on my Santa Claus, and I don't think it's going to be done by Christmas. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to put my long roll. What I'm thinking. Yeah. You know, I know of a bunch of people store their beads in um, storage containers. I just do it in uh, in um, baggies, pieces. Cheaper and easier for me. I don't know why, but let's see, let's do another shade of black. Could be a dark brown. Um, okay, so New England is no stranger to intriguing crime sagas and popular media chronicling. There are every twist and turn, from TV to from, I'm sorry, excuse me, I can't talk, <laughs> from movies to TV shows to books, podcasts, and more, few regions have proved more fertile for crime, true crime storytelling. Here's a sampling of New England cases that have been featured in true crime productions. Fashion writer Krista Worthington, 46, was found stabbed to death on the floor of her Truro home in January 2002 with her two-year-old daughter unharmed and clinging to her body. Oh, how sad. Oh, that is just terrible. You know, I don't want to sound mean or nothing, but why not just take the baby so they can be in heaven together? I mean... 
I can't believe somebody would just kill the mom and leave the baby like that. Christopher McCowan, the 46th the trash collector, was charged with her murder in 2005 and later convicted. McCowan has maintained his innocence and speculation about the case has continued thanks to multiple books, news specials, and a dramatized film. Oh. Well, you know, I didn't read it all because these are um, New England stories. Um, I, I just don't get it. I, I don't get why people are so freaking mean. How they can um, come in, you know, if they're going to sexually assault you, just sexually assault you and then leave. You don't have to kill them, you know. I mean, yeah, you might get uh, caught, but at least the person alive. I don't know. Anyway, uh, do any of you use a pen like this? Because I find it kind of difficult. <laughs> I'm trying to get used to it. And could one of you tell me, please, what this what this is? Is it supposed to be to straighten it up? Or? No, this, I know, is wax. And it sticks to it. No, if you sneak. Um, I have quite a, a few of these, but I don't know where I put them. I just found this one yesterday, going through boxes. Okay, now for the next one. Let's see here. One of the Bay State's most haunting cold cases. Eleven women went missing between April and September 1988. Nine of their bodies were found along highways in Greater New Bedford, while two remain missing. Closure and answers have eluded their families, investigators, and local residents ever since. Okay. Um, and this one is about Molly Bish. All right, Molly Bish was a 16-year-old Warren resident who disappeared from Collins Pond in 2000. Oh, wow. You know, I think that's the saddest part is not knowing what happened. You know, and, uh, especially if they never find you and you wonder what happened to your kid, you know. Um, you 
Yeah, I never had any kids. Um, yeah, it wasn't in the cards for me, but that's fine. But I can imagine, you know, what it would be like. I mean, it must be terrible to, to, uh, be looking for your daughter or your son and they'll never find them. Oh, heck with that one. I'm gonna use this one. Huh. Yeah, my mom bought me um, a uh, magnifying thing magnifying glass that goes around your head um in case I can't see a uh symbol and a pen for my birthday uh from Etsy so it hadn't got here yet and one of them don't ain't gonna get here until like October 20-something to November 1st, but that's okay. I can't remember which one, the pen or the... Uh, LED light, uh... Magnifier, magnifier. I can't wait to get it, though. I ordered some uh, stuff for your nails. Sorry, my nails are dirty. I need to go wash them. You know, I haven't been up long. and Everything I touch, it seems to get under my nails. I don't know. But uh, thank you for being here with me and, uh, with, you know, doing a whip and chat and true, true crime story today. My dish was a link 16, and this is sad. Shortly after she started working there as a lifeguard, three years after she was reported missing, Molly's partial remains were recovered from a hillside in, in Palma. Well, that's weird. My last name's Palmer. <laughs> A few miles from the pond. Her family received a fresh glimmer of hope in the unsolved case earlier this year. An anonymous tip led detectives to identify a person of interest. A registered sex offender who died in that 2016. Ambitious abduction and slain. And, and it was featured in CBS 48 Hours and Investigation Discoveries Disappeared. Oh, wow. I love Investigation Discovery. Yeah. So, so, um,
let's see here. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, no, I'm not. This next little segment is, uh, it is the in, inch, inch whistle merge. Rachel inch whistle, 27, and her nine, and, uh, what am I doing? Rachel Entrance was 27, her nine-month-old daughter, Lillian Rose. I love that name, Rose, because I collect roses. And were shot to death in their Hopkinton home in 2006, about 10 days after moving in. Neil Entrance, Rachel's husband, and Lillian's brother, Lillian Rose's father is serving life in prison for their murders. Oh my gosh, how could someone do that to their own child and their own wife? The case made national headlines because Neil was deeply in debt, moved the gun used in the shooting, and booked a one way flight to his native England without reporting finding their bodies to police. His family insists he is innocent. While Rachel's family and prosecutors have condemned the theories used to make that case. Oh, this one was the only investigation she's covered too. Handsome Devils and Michelle R. McPhee's book, Heartless, The True Crime of Neil Entwistle and the Cold Blooded Murder of His Wife and Child. Wow. And all of these are coming from uh, the Providence Journal. Who remember how we used to wear our hair like that? <laughs> yeah, she was murdered probably. She was only 14. Amy Carnival. Beverly resident Amy Carnival, 14, was fatally stabbed by her 16 year old boyfriend, Jamie Fuller, in August 1991. Oh my gosh, I was almost 21. Um, that's terrible. 16 years old, and you just wasted your life, buddy. <sighs> Let's see here. I'm going to change colors because I'm done with this one. On my section, anyway. Come on, open up. There we go. So, how's everybody's week been? And last week, that is. And, uh, 
I'm okay. I just want to a lot. I want to show you this. I collect hummingbirds also. And I need. I love it. I love it. I haven't used it. I just bought it for the hummingbird, but I might use it. Now, let's see here. I hope it don't go down. Let's see. And go out of the hole there. Alright. Give me just a minute. I'm looking for a color. Because it's, yeah, I need to find another one. Fishing and scrub royally. Let's see. I know it takes longer. To um, find the colors. In a uh, base, but that's what I'm used to, so. I'll just keep, keep it on. <laughs> yeah. I should have had all my colors ready. I'm sorry about that. Let's see. I guess I'll use this one. Here, let's see. I don't know if I can do the this I'll get my mom to hold it up while I record it and let you see why do I do that uh. I 
if you hear some that's my dog walking around the bed, you probably saw her. She's my sweet girl. And she's like a human. I let her out at night. Like, well, like early, early in the morning, like at four or something. And, um, and she comes right back to the bedroom door. Like, let me in, I'm tired. You know? <laughs> and she gets on the bed and goes right back to sleep. So let's read one more. Uh, in a wooded area near the vacant United Shoe Machinery Co Corporation, Fuller, who confessed to the crime, then tied cinder blocks to her and dumped her body in shoe pond off the K Street. A jury found Fuller guilty in 2012, rejecting the defense's claims at trial that Fuller committed the crimes due to jealousy and steroid and alcohol abuse. Oh. Amy Carnival, let's see. The dramatized 1996 NBC TV movie No One Would Tell and its 2018 Lifetime remake, each of which is based on a book of the same name. I saw that movie. I just couldn't. I don't remember the name of the person, but yeah, I think I think it's the one with uh, Candace Cameron in it, where he hit her and stuff, and then he killed her. And I remember he got life, and um. And, uh, he had wrapped her in this tarp thing and, and, put, her, and put her in the, uh, pond. And that poor mom, I mean, that was her only daughter. She had never had grandkids or nothing. I mean, it's just sad. But I remember his name in the movie. It was Bobby. So I don't know about his real name. Let's see. Jamie. Jamie Fuller was his name. Yes, yeah, so they changed the names in the um in the movie. Well, I appreciate you listening. To these uh, true crime shorts stories, short stories, um, and uh, 
the next time I get on here, I'll try to find Mary Sagan. And uh, it happened here in Atlanta. And uh, I want to tell that story. I believe that she deserves some kind of justice. And I'm going to, you know, because the person, well, I'm not going to tell you and spoil it. So, but thank you for watching and have a great, blessed day.